The short brochure you have before you outlines in some detail the, the career to date of Professor Andrew Deeks. When we first heard that we were getting an Australian as our new president, we were delighted, of course. Uh, we were even more delighted when we heard he was an engineer who had located the Durham University as Vice Chancellor for Science and Engineering from where he was appointed as president uh, of UCD. On hearing of his appointment, I immediately wrote to him to congratulate and welcome him. I said that in confidence, in, 19, in 2013, we were only coming out of recession. And while it was the Irish people who made the great human sacrifices, in fact, it was a series of international experts who had to prevail on the Irish government to fix our broken Irish economy. So to hear of another international expert coming as not the first but the second president of UCD, uh, following the footsteps of um, John Henry Newman, who was the only other non-Irish president, uh, he needn't have feared in the slightest because we got used to wanting outsiders to come and fix us. Unfortunately, that is the case. And to some extent, that is still the case. So, Andrew, you are most welcome, more welcome than you even thought you were. And I said that too, uh, just partially wearing a hat that I had, that I had given down, I had relinquished as president of Engineers Ireland. I knew that was the case, how welcome you were, would be as the first non-Irish president since John Henry Newman. Uh, and that, you know, that your inspiration as head of Ireland's largest university and indeed Irish, Ireland's largest engineering school would also help to lead us back to prosperity. And there are signs of that impact too, indeed. I immediately invited you to give the 2014 annual lecture, uh, but you wisely chose to get to know UCD, to get to know it better, to get to know it, to get to know it better in the first instance, to get to know the Irish scene and the Irish education system uh, also before speaking to us. And you then kindly offered to give this year's lecture, which you're now doing tonight. Uh, you have recently published a new UCD strategy, and I was uh, pleased and honored to be invited to the inaugural uh, address, which I found inspirational. And I know tonight will be another example of the type of inspiration you give, uh, which you know, you, 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 you'll demonstrate in a very practical way. And we welcome you, of course, as an engineer, but we know that you are all of the professions present here, and we respect that very much. Uh, and we feel privileged that you uh, would speak as be, you know, speak at our alumni association tonight. Uh, we look forward to your thoughts tonight on the challenges facing engineering education in the 21st century, and I won't go any further to steal your thunder. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to give you the president of UCD, Professor Andrew J. Deeks. It's a real privilege to be here to give this lecture to the Engineering Graduates Association. Uh, as PJ pointed out, then I, I've taken a roundabout route to come here to Ireland. So I did grow up in Perth in Western Australia, and I was educated as a civil engineer at the University of Western Australia. Uh, I spent maybe a year then working in industry before I went back to the University of Western Australia, did a master's went back out into industry, uh, was asked to come back and give some occasional lectures, enjoyed it, uh, then came back to become uh, what was then called a, a senior tutor, at which point they told me that if I wanted a career in academia, I'd have to do a PhD. So I started work on a PhD, initially part-time, eventually converting to full-time because I felt, found it very difficult to be doing two things at once finished the PhD, became a lecturer. At the same time, uh, I was doing quite a bit of consulting work with industry, which I kept up for, for most of my academic career, uh, but then worked through the grades from lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, professor, took over the, uh, the reins of the School of Civil and Resource Engineering at UWA, spent five years doing that, uh, then with colleagues around me trying to insist that I did another five-year term, uh, fled to Durham to become the Pro Vice Chancellor of Science there. So that was a, a very interesting course. 
and you'd realize that at Durham then engineering was part of a very large uh, faculty of science. So I enjoyed that, but one day, uh, as happens, got a call from the headhunters who said, you know, it's all very well you being at Durham, but would you uh, consider a position in Dublin? And uh, I looked into UCD and saw what a great university it was. I also saw that it was uh, integrally connected with the formation of the Irish state. And as PJ has mentioned, since John Henry Newman, every president has been an Irishman. So I thought, well, you know, it's all very nice them ringing me up, but I, I don't think I have much of a shot here, but I'll uh, give it a go anyway. And as they say, the rest is history. I've been in the role for uh, a year, four, four and a half months now, very much enjoying it. Fantastic colleagues. I've actually found it quite easy to come to Ireland to work, having had the experience of moving from Australia to England, where, and particularly a university like Durham, with, with all due respect, it's a great university, but it is quite traditional. It's quite difficult to, to shift things and get things done. And uh, us Australians, we like to get things done and like to get things changed. Coming to Ireland, I, I very much found that the innovativeness and the willingness of the Irish to give things a go, it's very similar to the Australian culture. I might talk about that a little bit more later on. So I found myself very much at home coming here to UCD, coming to Dublin, and I feel right at home today being amongst engineers. That's, that's the thing I have missed a bit in all, all of this senior management stuff, not enough engineers. So we've got all Ophelia as Vice President for Research, Innovation and Impact, and of course we have David Fitzpatrick as the College Principal for Engineering and Architecture on the senior management team. So I'm working towards it, getting more engineers up there. Okay, anyway, I, I diverse. Is uh, the volume enough? Can people hear me at the back without the microphone? Okay, great. So now the, the topic that I'm going to talk to you about is the challenges for engineering education in the 21st century. And this is very much just a personal perspective. Having spent 20 years teaching in Australia, a place which, uh, as I indicated before, is quite willing to change. And so there were quite a lot of experiments that happened in education in general, but in engineering education in Australia during that time. And so I'll talk very much from that perspective. And you might try, try then to see how this fits with your experience, particularly those of you that experienced the Irish education system over a similar period of time, to see what the, the similarities and differences are. So in terms of the talk today, what I want to go through is just a very little bit in terms of the history of our engineering education. I want to talk about what I've called old challenges. And those are the things that have been around since we actually started with formal engineering education in, at university level. Challenges which uh, John Henry Newman was talking about in his book, The Idea of a University, uh, and talk about where we've got to with those. I've got something here which I call educational fads. Now, that, that's not to put these uh, efforts down, and when we go and talk about them, you'll recognize some of these things, but uh, particularly in Australia, there's a tendency to get hold of something new and then to drive it to the absolute extreme, you know, past the limits of where it should have been used. And that's why I've called these fads. And I'll, I'll talk about how some of these emerged in Australia. I'll then talk about the new opportunities as I see it in the 21st century that have come about from the changes that we have witnessed over the last 20 years and the opportunities then that those uh, present. I'll talk a little bit then about the rather difficult topic of assessment within that context before summarizing what I see as being the challenges so that maybe then we can have some discussion and get some uh, different points of view on things. So uh, I have to say this is very much a personal view and not everyone will agree with it, which is great. That's why we have a university uh, and I don't see any of this as being, as setting out something in stone here. So if we look back at the history of engineering, then as we all know, engineering started really formally in the military 
uh, as uh, uh, the engineering cores were set up, and it was very much uh, a trade that was developed and people learnt on the job, they were apprenticed. And it wasn't till then in the 18th century that engineering started to move from the military regime into the civil regime, where again it was pretty much a trade with an apprenticeship system. And it was only in the 19th century that it then started to move into a vocational training and from there to a university education in the latter part of the 19th century. And then as we came into the later part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, we started to see a formalization of engineering training, formalization of the empirical, the mathematical, the scientific basis, the emergence of codes and standards of engineering. And it was an interesting time because if you think of the end of the 19th century, that was about the time that a lot of things were being standardized. If you think about the football codes, you think about cricket, this was the time when rules were being written down, games were being standardized, a lot of things were being standardized. Science, engineering was also being standardized. And that really set up the basis for the engineering education system which we have today, which has persevered then through the 20th century, with then towards the end of the 20th century, there's starting to be a questioning of whether the formal basis that we were teaching uh, our students was actually the appropriate one. So this, this is just very much a brief overview of where we've come from. Now, if I talk about the old challenges, as I said, the first one, the challenge is the challenge of a broad education versus an education with technical depth. And this was a debate that was going on at the time that Newman was setting up this university in 1854. If you read Newman's book, The Idea of the University, then a lot of it is his defense of a broad education against the emerging technical education that was going on in various institutions, particularly in the UK at that time. And the, the question remains today. You can see that there have been many attempts, particularly in the later part of the 20th century and more recently, in terms of the question, how broadly should we educate our engineers? Uh, as we came towards the end of the 20th century, particularly in Australia, then there was a flourishing of all types of degree programs. So there were Bachelor of Oil and Gas Engineering, there was a Bachelor of Offshore Engineering. Bachelor of Mechatronics is, is quite popular. So there was a whole flourishing of different degree programs that were very much deep degrees. They went into a, a particular area. But there was also a reaction against that, that is that what we want to do in terms of e educating engineers? Shouldn't we be giving them a broader education where they can go out, find their way, they might move from one area of engineering to another. Something that emerged around that time in Australia which was combined degrees, and I don't know how much that, that came here, but it was very much the idea that you have a Bachelor of Engineering, you have a Bachelor, say, of Science. If you put the two degrees together and you give cross credit for some of the modules and you add a year to the program and you overload the students slightly, that within five years the students could get two bachelor's degrees. And that, that worked and then it was extended. So we had combined degrees, Bachelor of Engineering, Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Engineering, Bachelor of Economics. There was then a Bachelor of Engineering, Bachelor of Law, but that couldn't quite fit into five years so it was extended out to six. So there was then a proliferation of these combined degrees and the idea was that this was one way of giving the students breadth. Now, you, you probably are aware of then the way that the, uh, the trend went within Australia. It was very much looking at what happened in Europe with the Bologna system, but also looking at the US, where the common practice in the US is to have a very broad undergraduate degree, followed by a professional postgraduate degree. So the University of Melbourne in Australia decided that Looking at Bologna, but applying US principles, they would go to have a broad undergraduate degree, and they would do away with undergraduate engineering degrees, have a broad science degree, which would then lead to a postgraduate engineering qualification. 
The university I was at, the University of Western Australia, decided that that sounded like a good thing to do, and so we followed along and created the University of Western Australia model, which was slightly different. Now, in order to make that work, the undergraduate degrees, although they were supposed to be broad, they still had to have quite a bit of technical content. So it, it took a lot of massaging. But the basic idea was that you should educate the student first broadly and then give them technical depth afterwards. Now, of course, here, here at uh, UCD, then the Horizons uh, modular curriculum has been adopted to attempt to give that breadth to all students. And engineering students have a number of options they can take. And this is, again, trying to address this issue of breadth versus technical depth. The reason I put it up there as an old challenge is to say that since Newman, people have been talking about it. And it's an open question, because there are advantages in giving our students a broad education. There are also advantages in giving our students a deep ed education. And maybe we need to look at the balance there. Now, the, the second old challenge is this challenge of giving our students the technical foundations so that they understand the science, they understand the mathematics, they understand where the empirical formulas they use have come from and how they've been developed, versus students that just take effectively a cookbook approach, maybe through the codes, the standards, uh, and uh, a set of formula, and apply them to problems. And traditionally, at least in Australia, then the universities would educate students using the first approach, that the idea was, would be that they would make sure the students had strong technical foundations, and they weren't so concerned about making sure that they could design to the code, for example. Whereas what started off as institutes of technology, but later in Australia became universities of technology, they would adopt a, a more cookbook approach, but produce graduates who were ready to go straight to work when they came out of the university. Now, over the, the years, I've had quite a lot to do with uh, industry partners in the university talking to industry advisory boards. And what I've found is that there are very clearly different types of employers. And it's generally the small to medium employers, small to medium sized business employers are looking for graduates to come out ready to work in the areas that they need them to work. The larger employers are really asking, or they were asking me, they were saying, just give us intelligent graduates who know how to think, who are adaptable. Don't worry about making them ready to work from the day they come out. We we'll handle that. Just give us good graduates who can think, who understand the basics. So for educators, it's a tension because we have to satisfy all of our, our employer groups. So again, it's this question of where do, you, where do you find the balance? It's the breadth, the technical depth, it's the theoretical foundations, it's the applied skills. So I'm saying these are old challenges because they're not solved. We still are moving one way or another trying to find that balance. OK, so this is, this is the bit that I've called educational fads. And the, some of these things you, you will recognize, but some of them as well in Australia, we went quite overboard with them. So the, the first is outcomes-based education. And in Australia, I think this, this first came out of the vocational sector. And it was the idea that uh, if you're training a welder, you have certain requirements that you want that welder to achieve. They have to be able to uh, make a weld of certain depth, certain breadth to a certain quality, and that's all you need. So over time, the vocational education, particularly in Western Australia, went totally to an outcomes base, so that they didn't give grades anymore. They simply specified for each course the outcomes that were to be achieved, and as the student finished the course, all they got was a pass. So th this was an interesting way of doing education, and one that then started to come into the university sector, so that for each module that we taught, we had to specify just the outcomes 
that we were to achieve through that module, outcomes that were measurable in terms of student performance. Now, this shouldn't specify knowledge. This had to specify what the students could actually do. So it, at the university, as universities do, we said, well, that, you know, that's interesting, but uh, we're not sure that that's the best way to do it. So we rather cynically just uh, redesigned, uh, you know, specified outcomes based on what we thought we were achieving through the modules and went through a, a tick box exercise. In uh, Western Australia, this move to outcomes-based education got such momentum behind it that a group redesigned the entire primary and high school curriculums on the basis of outcomes education. So in each stage, instead of specifying the knowledge that they expect the students to achieve or to have covered uh, and the skills, they specify them in terms of outcomes. Over time, this has been peeled back because, again, it was found to be uh, an overreaction. There, there are some places where outcomes-based uh, courses are very useful, others where they're not. The next one I've got on this list is problem-based learning, and some of you will be familiar with problem-based learning. It really emerged from medical education, and it, the basis behind it is that students will learn the most from things that they discover and work out themselves. And so that rather than giving students a course of study, which accumulates knowledge, accumulates skills in the way that the lecturer thinks the students should do, what you do is give them problems, allow them to work in groups, and the, as a result of working through the problems, they discover what knowledge they need to know, they go away and find that knowledge, and they have then advanced. So this works quite well in a medical setting where actually a doctor in the end when they graduate is looking at a patient is all the time then going back and trying to work out well what, what's wrong with the patient. It doesn't work so well in an engineering setting. It's useful in an engineering setting but it's difficult uh, and this is from a civil engineer to get the students to discover all of the theory bef behind the mechanics of materials, concrete design, concrete mix, mix technology, just by giving them a problem. Often, as I indicated before, an engineering problem can be solved simply by referring to a code or a formula book that doesn't give you any understanding of what's led to those formula, what's led to that code. And that's not what we would expect from our students. Now, to give you some idea, of just how far things can go in Australia. There's a university in Australia that will remain nameless whose vice chancellor, when she came into the role, decided that problem-based learning was a good thing. In fact, it was such a good thing that the whole university should establish its identity on problem-based learning. And so she decided that there would be no more lectures and she outlawed lectures in the university. Everything had to be done on a problem-based learning basis. And so I had some colleagues working in that university, and they, this is in engineering, and they said in the end they were doing underground lectures. You know, they, <laughs> so they'd set the students the problems, uh, but then you know, they'd have a little lecture, so they'd be able to go through the basics of the concrete, the, et cetera, et cetera, so the students could actually do the problems. I'm happy to say that that vice chancellor is no longer there and the university has moved back to a more balanced approach. But it, again, it shows you what can, can happen. There, there are a couple of other things here, the peer-led uh, team learning, just-in-time teaching, the flipped classroom you've probably been hearing uh, a lot about recently. The idea of the flipped classroom is a bit, a bit like just-in-time teaching. The idea is that uh, using modern technology you can have lectures on the computer. You can have all the actual instructional material on the computer. The students can look at the instructional material outside of the class. They do look at the instructional material and perhaps the lectures uh, at home on the computer, and then they come to class and do the problem-solving bit. The things that previously would have been allocated as homework are now done in the class with the instructor there able to give assistance, working in groups, and looking at lectures now goes to 
home where you can do it on the internet. So this is the idea of the flipped classroom. I've put in there massive open online courses because everyone's talking about these, or at least they were a couple of years ago. Less people are talking about them now. And this was something which was supposed to revolutionize higher education. It was supposed to make all of us redundant. You know, why would anyone want a university in Ireland when you could go onto the internet and you could do a course at MIT? And as we've seen, there is less and less talk about massive open online courses because distance education has been with us for an extremely long time, almost as long a time as universities have been ex in existence. The technology has changed over time. But distance courses will always be appropriate to some students, but they will never give the same experience that coming to a university like this one gives. And only a portion of the experience we have at a university like this is actually sitting in lectures, doing uh, course material, doing the sort of things that you can do at distance. A lot of the other activities are things that just can't be done at distance. So there will be a place for MOOCs, but they're not going to replace universities like our one. Now, I should say with all these things, there's a place for all of them. It's a matter of moderation. We should have some modules which are using problem-based learning. We should have outcomes-based uh, descriptions of modules in places. We should have some peer-led team learning, some just-in-time teaching, some flipped classroom, and even some online courses. But we just don't go the way that the Australians have gone in each of these and take it to the extreme. It's a matter of having a balance. So that's what I wanted to indicate there. Now, if we think about the 21st century, uh, I've indicated how engineering education evolved. And if we think of our traditional engineering education, the one that most of the people would have in this room, myself included, would have gone through, where we learned a lot of mathematics, we learned uh, some basic science subjects, we then learned uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of theory that backed up, in, in my case, the, the engineering mechanics, et cetera, which then allowed us to work through to doing calculations which would support design, and in the latter part of the course, then we moved on to design and to employing the many techniques that, that we'd used. And we would learn often many more techniques than we'd ever end up applying. We'd learn to uh, solve buckling problems by solving the second order differential equation, I should say fourth order differential equation, subject to uh, all the boundary conditions. But of course, having done that, when we went to do the design, we would never be solving buckling problems that way. So we, we, we learned a lot of mathematics, of science, of techniques, and then we learned how to design. Things, things have been changing, and if you look at the way they've been changing coming into the 21st century, we now have such computing power that we could have only imagined previously. And if we look at the way that, uh, let's say, structural analysis, I spent years and years teaching structural analysis. I teach people how to do moment redistribution to uh, analyze uh, uh, indeterminate beams. I teach people flexibility methods. I teach people uh, stiffness methods to do all of this analysis. This analysis now can be done extremely simply on a computer program, very visually, moment diagrams popping out in no time. Uh, and that type of computation didn't exist at the time that we designed the engineering education that has moved through the, the 20th century. So the computation that we have now is just extraordinary. The communication ability we have now. Again, this is extraordinary. I have spent, uh, of the last six weeks, probably only a couple actually here in Dublin, traveling, uh, doing various things for the university. But in that time, while I was away, I was able to chair our senior management team meeting. Uh, I was able to participate in the Irish Universities Association Council meeting. Now, it has to be said, it was about three o'clock in the morning when I did that, but I was still able to do it, no, 
despite the fact I was in uh, Chicago. Uh, and that sort of communication is relatively recent in development. We can see its effect in the way that engineering is done. Engineering is now done on a, a global basis. And I don't really need to tell you here in this room, you, you all experience it, uh, the globalization of the entire environment in a way that when we were doing our undergraduate courses would be absolutely unimaginable. In that, we, we then have mobility. If you look at the mobility of not only the engineers that work in your companies and where they might have come from, but the mobility of our students. So currently we have 18% of our undergraduate students will spend part of their studies somewhere else in the world. A few years ago that would have been unthinkable. In a few years time it's likely to be even more than that. The world has got effectively smaller through the communication, through the cheapness in travel, the, this uh, increase in mobility. The last thing I put on there is the rate of change. It's clear when you look back just 10 years, then the idea of just being able to pull out a computer anywhere in the world and have a video link back to your base and have a, a very acceptable meeting experience, it was not imaginable. So the rate of change is extraordinary and we'll, we clearly have to ensure that our students coming out are able to operate in an environment that has all of these characteristics. But I think that then what we need to think about is what does that mean for our traditional engineering education? And what parts of that education should we be reconsidering and perhaps reconfiguring in order to ensure that our graduates are best, uh, are best prepared to take their place in this changing society? So th this is what I've put as being the new challenges. Remember the, the old challenges that I, I put to you was this uh, idea of how do we balance the requirement for breadth with the uh, requirement for technical depth? And how do we balance how much of the theoretical foundations we give our students with the skills to immediately go and, and uh, do the work they need to do? Now, combined with that, th this is a new challenge. As I said, the computer power we have now is extraordinary. When our students, our civil engineers, go out into industry, they're not going to be solving indeterminate beams even manually. They're going to be using computer packages. Do we need to be teaching them moment redistribution as a, a technique? Probably not. It's probably disappeared from most engineering curriculum at this stage. But the question is, how much manual calculation do we need to have our students doing so they generate those skills that are associated with engineers, that problem-solving ability, the analytical ability that we all associate with our profession. So if, if we move it all so that they're just using computer packages to do that, will we lose that? Will we lose some of that? What's, th what's the balance? So I'd say that traditionally we, we've been teaching a lot of things that they probably didn't need practically. The question is how much of those things actually being contributing to training the mind to give us the uh, fantastic engineers that we have as graduates today. So I think this, this balance is a challenge. How do we get this one right? The next one there is group work versus individual work. We all know that once uh, our graduates finish here and they go out and work in your companies, they'll be spending a lot of time working in groups, but they also have to be able to do individual work. And in the past, then, there has been little group work in, in engineering curriculum. Over the last 20 years, then, the group work has been coming in more and more. But group work uh, at university level presents some challenges. And uh, some of that's to do with assessment, and uh, I'll talk about that later. But because in, in a work situation, everyone has a role, and, and they will uh, complete that role, hopefully, with appropriate supervision, in a university situation where a lecturer says has a class this big and divides them up into 10 groups or 20 groups, 
it's very difficult to ensure that every student is participating fully in the work that those groups are doing. And the incentive for other students in the group, particularly the brighter students, is to just make sure that the task is done. And so there, there are difficulties. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we, when we talk about assessment. So the question is, how much individual work do we assign the students? How much should they be doing in groups? Now, the next uh, topic I put down here is in terms of generic skills. And something uh, as uh, an academic leader in a university talking to uh, business leaders, then there is always uh, a request for more generic skills. We don't only want our engineers to be technically excellent when they come out and being able to think, we want them to be able to communicate well. We want them to give excellent presentations. We want them to work in teams. And we want those, those leadership skills, those generic skills. So this, this is more and more a requirement for our engineering graduates that they come out with these skills. They also come out into an environment which is much more interdisciplinary than it used to be. So my, my first job when I graduated with my bachelor's degree was uh, in what was then called the Metropolitan Water Authority in Perth. And it, it was a government organization which effectively ran the entire water supply and sewerage and drainage system of the entire city. And this was an organization of the type that uh, many of you that are of my vintage or, or maybe a little bit older will recognize. It was uh, an organization that was mainly engineers mainly male engineers, and everything that was done was done in an engineering way. Everything was done in-house. All the design was done in-house. All of the operations were done in-house. It was an engineering organization, monoblock. Now, over time, things changed very significantly, and parts of that operation were privatized or, or were put out to tender. The organization was dropped in size. The engineering expertise went away. And the organization became a, a much more uh, heterogeneous organization. It wasn't run by engineers anymore. And that happened in Australia in many of these monoblock uh, engineering uh, departments. I'm not sure whether it happened here. It was certainly a feature of the Australian system. To the extent that these government departments in Australia have virtually no engineering expertise anymore, and the engineers that they have within them are effectively project managers that manage projects which are now done uh, by private industry. But what it means is that now the skills that engineers need require much more in the way of the team working skills, being able to work with people from other disciplines, because we don't have these monoblock organizations which are just engineering organizations. I think if you looked at most of your organizations represented in, in the room today, your engineers are probably just a small portion of your workforce. They're a very important portion of the workforce, but they're part of an interdisciplinary team. So we need to ensure that our students come out with the skills that they need to work in those interdisciplinary teams. Increasingly, as I said, we're working in a global world. We're working in organizations with people that come from many different cultures, we should be preparing our engineers to work in an intercultural environment and to be comfortable in an intercultural environment. And because of the rate of change, we need them to have transferable skills. The jobs that they do when they graduate are certainly not the same jobs they're going to be doing in 40 years' time. We're going to have to make sure that they have the transferable skills. Now, in terms of before we go on to that, in terms of then the opportunities, I think that what we have is an opportunity that as we do more using computers, where we can take out some of the repetitive manual calculations, some of the, the techniques that we've taught our students, thinking that they will help them understand the basic principles, perhaps some of those can be taken out. And that through using computer analysis, they could, but still giving them the fundamentals, that we could make room in the curriculum for some of the other skills that I've put down here. 
And, and that's, I think, something that might be a little bit controversial. As I said before, one way of looking at, at the way that we educate our engineers is that by making them solve lots of problems and work through steps analytically, that's how we've trained their minds. But th on the other hand, we need to be looking at all the things we want from our graduates in this day and age. And so how do we make room for that? I think it, it's we, we have to look at the balance. We have to look at where we can make some room and fit some more things in. Now, communication skills, it's very easy to say. But how do you actually teach communication skills? We know how to teach engineering. It's, we've done it for more than a century, and we inherit a tradition. There is not a century tradition in teaching communication skills, in teaching teamwork skills, leadership skills. And I guess we, we have to be a little bit sympathetic to our colleagues in the social sciences who really, over the last 200 years, should have been developing these things. But when you look at what's come out, then there's, there's very little that we can use. So as an engineer, it's sometimes a bit frustrating. But if you look at some of the things that have come up in recent years, you see that probably our social science colleagues are where engineers were 100 years ago in terms of starting to develop some theories, some frameworks that can be used to teach the communication skills, the team working skills, the leadership skills, and the intercultural working. And I'm sure many of you have been to programs which are leadership programs, or maybe they're, they're team development programs, where various uh, uh, psychology type tests, uh, personality tests have been brought in, uh, which then show you that the different members of the teams have different personalities with different strengths. How many people have participated in those types of programs? Okay. So, of course, if you've done Myers-Briggs, then, then you're using uh, theories which were discredited a long time ago. The idea of personality types and there being one personality type and then a completely different personality type, this is it's total nonsense and has been discredited in the literature a long time ago. However, it's still a useful tool in starting to teach you the ideas of people being different, there being difference between people, different strengths in different people. But you'll, you'll see that there have been a number of things that have come up that show us that the social scientists are starting to move towards things that can be workable. If you've gone to those types of courses, then you'll have also seen quite a lot on emotional intelligence. That, that was popularized by Daniel Goleman. Uh, again, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of academic colleagues in the area have criticized this as being pop psychology, but in the, the various programs that are used to teach leadership, this is being used more and more. Now, I'm not saying this is the right thing or the wrong thing. It's simply that there are frameworks like this starting to be developed which are useful and which perhaps we should be exposing our students to at some stage and probably late stages uh, in their programs. Similarly, it, in terms of dimensions of individual difference, as I said to you, if you did Myers-Briggs and personality types, then the, this is uh, uh, the, the sort of discussion that was going on in the 1930s. The current state of the art in terms of personality traits seems to have settled down on, on this, and I thought you might be interested to see that the social scientists are gradually converging on models. Now, not everyone agrees with this, but there's a lot more agreement than there used to be, where in the past, each psychologist had their completely different model. So this is one that's uh, achieving more uh, agreement amongst the various psychologists. Again, I'm not saying this is right. I'm simply saying that there are starting to emerge models which might be uh, solid enough that we could use them in terms of educating engineers about personal difference, about strengths, weaknesses, working together with people in, in an appropriate manner. And similarly, there, there are also models of cultural difference developing. And this is one which, again, has achieved quite a bit of, of traction. So dimensions of cultural difference, you can see six of them here. And they're, they're quite interesting to look at. Uh, and uh, things like 
power distance. So uh, those of you that have worked across cultures will be aware that there are very significant differences in power distance in, in cultures. And we can think of, of, certainly my experience of Ireland is the power distance is quite, uh, quite low. Uh, and Australians would be similarly low in terms of power distance, but I'm sure you can think of some countries with very high power distance. Again, the, the point here is that there are starting to emerge models that we could use to educate our students about differences in culture, differences in personality, and bring in the ideas of how you work together as a team, how you actually exploit the advantages of different cultural points of view. Now, as I said, the student mobility experiences, which again are a part of allowing our students to develop this awareness of cultural difference, of individual difference, uh, have been growing very significantly. We have quite a number of students spending a year abroad, spending a semester abroad. We have many students coming from the United States and spending a year here or a semester here. There are increasing international summer schools, joint programs, and many students now do postgraduate programs abroad. So we're bringing in these means by which our students can prepare themselves better to take their place in the 21st century society. Now I want to talk just a little bit here about the capstone educational experiences. Now many of you in your engineering program, you will have done a research project at the end of your studies and you will have worked with a supervisor. Uh, I think at a research intensive university, this is still an extremely valuable experience. I think that all students that graduate from a university like this, at the end of their studies, they should have got involved in research. They should be working closely with a, a member of the faculty who has research interests in a certain way. The students should actually have the feeling that they're on the cusp of knowledge, that they're able to contribute to the development of knowledge. So I think this is a, an important part of the educational experience we give our students. It's been part of uh, an engineering education experience for many years now, and I, I definitely think it's something that we, we need to keep. Now, many of you also will have, in, in your final year, been involved in an engineering group project of some sort, which has been designed to expose you to actually working on an engineering project. And those, those are still valuable, but I, I think to some extent, and for the reason that I, I said earlier, perhaps less important than they have been, in the sense that if you do an engineering group project, you're only working with other engineers and normally other engineers of your particular discipline. What we're seeing increasingly is opportunities for students to participate in interdisciplinary group projects. I put down here the uh, example of Enactus. Enactus is actually a global organization that has uh, a contest for students where students with uh, uh, mentors from industry get together and form effectively small companies that engage in social enterprise. So they form a business plan and then they start to execute that business plan. There are country competitions, there's an international competition. Uh, coincidentally, last year the UCD team came fourth in the world in the, the final of this competition in Beijing. But the important part about these student groups is they're interdisciplinary. The, there's the, the group that won, there was an engineer there, there were students from various disciplines in the university. And I went to a, a debrief session where the students got up and talked about their experience. And each one of them found it incredibly valuable to be working in a team with students from different disciplines. And that, if you think about it, is the model. That's what they're going to be doing when they get out there. And they learn a lot from that. So, I'm suggesting here that we need to be thinking about more opportunities for the students in their capstone uh, experience to be working not just with engineers, but with students from, from different disciplines, allowing them to build up that idea of individual difference and of, of the value of individual difference and different perspectives.
Okay, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about assessment here because assessment is absolutely from the point of uh, an academic, and I, I think I speak for my colleagues here, the worst part of the job. You know, if you could be an academic without having to do any assessment, it would be really great. But uh, unfortunately, we have to do it. Uh, I, I have been a bit amused coming to Ireland to see that the uh, school teachers are uh, having difficulty with the fact that they would have to assess their own students uh, in the junior cycle. Uh, that was a debate that happened in Australia 30 years ago, and the teachers lost the debate. And in Australia, the teachers do have to assess their own students, just as we do uh, here at uh, UCD. Now, th this is a challenge, because again, one can say that uh, an exam, if we have a, a traditional exam at the end of the course, then we should be able to test what the student has learnt. We can test some of their skills, but clearly only on a very small basis. If we're talking about engineering, any decent engineering task is going to take you a lot longer than the three hours you have in an exam. So having continuous assessment then is an important complement. And the question is, what's the balance between exam and continuous assessment? There are some universities in the UK and uh, the, some very old universities uh, in England where they still don't have any exams in first year. So the students go, don't get any exams till the end of second year. There's no assessment done. And they have to uh, cram at the end of second year. And the, the idea is that by doing all of that cramming at once, the students somehow integrate the knowledge it does put uh, an awful lot of pressure on the students. I think that what we need to do is to think about the correct balance between the exam and the continuous assessment. And as with many of these things, going all one way or all the other way is probably not the uh, answer. Now, the assessment of group projects is something which academics right the way around the world struggle with. Because once you put a group of people together, if you just assess the output, that's fine. But how do you map that assessment back to the contributions of the individuals in the group? We want students to work in groups. If you want students to actually do work, you need to assign some value to the, what they produce at the end. But how do you assess that, and how do you map it back to the groups? Various things have been tried. So one way is to have the, uh, the um, instructor observe the groups and how the groups behave and then try to proportion something of the mark to the individuals. But as you'd appreciate for any decent project, that's a very difficult thing to do. Another thing that's been tried is to have the individual members of the group assess the relative contribution of each other person on the group. But you can appreciate that can break down. And you could have one student in such a group actually doing all the work, and the other students ganging up to say, well, actually, we all did the work, and that person didn't. There, there can be some very strange things that come out of it. So it's been tried with moderate success. And I, I think, generally, the approach has been to say, well, we, we can't really determine who's contributed what, and we'll just give each person the same amount, uh, the same mark. Which means the more group assessment you have, the more opportunity there is for someone to cruise through without making the contribution, without engaging in the material the way that you would want. And this, I think, uh, <laughs> emphasizes the requirement to have this balance between exam assessment and, and continuous assessment. And then the... The last point I put down there is the assessment of the transferable skills. And to some extent, it also goes into the discussion that uh, I uh, brought forward earlier, which is that we should be preparing our students with generic skills, with, you know, the communication skills, the uh, teamwork skills, the leadership skills. But are we qualified to do that? I mean, with all due respect to my colleagues, and I know that my colleagues here are fantastic in terms of their team working and their leadership, but do we have the faculty who have the skills, the
the knowledge and the experience to talk to our students about working interculturally, to talk to them about working in teams, to teach them the detailed communication skills that they need. So I think that's, that's the challenge. And then the assessment of these skills. We can write down big lists of generic skills that our engineering program develops. We can uh, indicate the transferable skills there. But how are we going to assess that those skills have actually been obtained? Uh, you as employers can probably tell us whether the graduates that you've got have those skills. But the, the question is whether we, as professional academics, have the skills, one, to teach those things, and two, to assess them. Right, so I, I'm coming towards the end here, and this is very much a, a summary of what I've put before you. And as I said, I haven't come to you here with, with answers. I've come to you with the challenges, which I think will be challenges going forward, and we will go one way, we will try things, they, some things will work, some things won't work. And it will be interesting to get some views from uh, the, the assembly here in terms of these things and your particular view. So we've, we've got this ongoing challenge, the breadth versus technical depth, uh, the theoretical foundations versus the applied skills that you need to have to go out immediately to become useful. Then the replacement in practice of manual calculation almost exclusively now by computer analysis. And then how much should we alter the balance in the undergraduate program? How much group work versus individual work uh, with all of the caveats that I have just indicated there on too much group work and you, you might be facing graduates who don't have the skills that you want because they managed to maneuver their way through. Uh, but if we have too much individual work, then you're having graduates that don't have the team working skills. And that brings us on to those generic and transferable skills. How do we teach them at a comprehensive university like UCD? We have faculty who are excellent at research. Are they also going to be excellent at teaching the generic and the transferable skills? Should we do, be doing it explicitly? The interdisciplinary working. How do we generate then opportunities that allow the students to develop the skills for interdisciplinary working and then for the intercultural working that they need? And then in all of that good stuff at the end, how do we assess it and make sure that the assessment appropriately reflects the achievements of each student? So as I said, uh, this talk was about the challenges of engineering education in the 21st century. The challenges are there because the answers are not there yet. We've explored, in Australia, we explored various ways of doing this, and I've described some of them to you. I'm sure here in Ireland, you've explored various ways of doing each of these things and got some things right and maybe some things not so right. Uh, but this is an ongoing discussion. And so I put them before you, and I'm looking forward then to uh, comments and uh, suggestions, perhaps, in how we might take this forward. Thank you, President, very much. I think you've touched on all of the areas that, uh, you know, even us non-academics but practitioners in the field realize are burning questions in the whole education sphere, not just in engineering, indeed. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the comparison between uh, the challenges that, that currently are there for the teachers at second level, and we're watching that space quite closely because it impacts on the quality of, of uh, uh, student and the quality of product that comes in here. Um, and uh, we have, you know, engineering colleges in this country who have adopted different models with varying degrees of success. They've all been successful. We've all been successful to some extent, but as you say, there, there is no one ma magic bullet. A um, uh, most comprehensive um, talk for which we're great, very grateful. And I, ho I look forward now to a, to a comprehensive uh, uh, 
stress testing of Andrew, <laughs> if you don't mind. I think he's looking forward to it, actually. Um, so um, if you have a question to ask, please raise your hand and give us your name and your affiliation, because it helps, it helps the president get some context for the question. Thank you. Jane Grimson, former Dean of Engineering and President of Engineers Ireland. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for a very interesting, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, and I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. I'd like to add one challenge to your list, which probably will come in no surprise to anyone. Um, there's a tremendous shortage of engineers, and in particular women engineers. So I think there is a question to be asked as to what we need to do to make our engineering, more, uh, engineering programs more attractive to women. You're absolutely right, and of course it, it is a question around the world what we need to do. Yeah, I think we've got this off at the moment. All so right, okay. okay. Worry about it. <laughs> uh, and it may well be that some of the things that I've talked about here in where we might need to expand engineering education would actually make the profession more attractive uh, to women because many of the skills that women are traditionally good at can, we need in the profession and they're the ones that are, I've been pointing out here. So it may be that through an adjustment of our engineering education, we could make it more balanced. Remember that th this is an education system back in the late 1800s, uh, 1800s and early 1900s, was put together by men, basically. And so we have a traditional system that was designed by men, valuing the things that, that men value. So I think that by broadening the way we think about engineering, it may be possible to make it more attractive. I don't know whether that, that would coincide with your, your thought. Thank you very much. So there's a question of how we, we then kind of uh, package that and get that message across. <coughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's something that we could only do together. Yeah. OK, next question. Yeah. Okay, now what I said was that uh, distant, uh, distance education has been around for a long time and what we're seeing is in fact a change of the technology that's being used for distance education. And it, the change in technology is making it more accessible, it's also making the experience uh, much, much better and so more people are then attracted to it. But it, it's not uh, a replacement for uh, traditional university education where, where people are coming together 
And many of the skills that I talked about here, the additional skills, are developed when people come together and participate in activities together. So while I think that uh, those activities will continue, I don't see that we have a huge competitive advantage in that space. The reason I say that is because you have places like the Open University who have been doing distance education forever. <laughs> they, they have entire uh, staff cohorts that are doing that all the time. Uh, I think that it's useful to have some activities of that kind that really raise the profile of the universities. But I am familiar with one university in Australia that went very much down the online provision to the extent that two-thirds of their students are not on campus. They're, they're online students. The experience for those students, I, I couldn't say it's a, it's a typical online experience, the experience for the staff is absolutely dreadful. Because if you think about it, I said before that the worst part of being an academic is the fact you have to do assessment. Once you've got your students online, then most of what you have to do is assessment. And you don't have the interacting with the students that you would normally have in a lecture, tutorial, you know, group work situation. So the, the staff in that university became very disillusioned at what, what they were having to do. So that, that's where I think it's useful to have a, a proportion of that, blended learning. But the advantage of a university like UCD is we have a fabulous campus here in Dublin, a fantastic city. We have great staff. We have great students coming from around the world, from around Ireland, from Dublin, mixing together, engaging. This is our competitive advantage. Online, we don't have any competitive advantage over that Australian university, over the Open University, etc. So uh, while respecting that there, there is work that can be done in that space, I don't see that we should be moving there, you know, lock, stock and barrel. Thank you. I'm sorry to thank you for introducing yourself. John Henry, retired professor. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, John. Next question, yeah. Yeah, uh, Jerry Byrne from uh, UCD and New York. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I think this is very, very important to the next for for engineering in Ireland. Uh, is there a silver bullet or is there a magic bullet to keep it? That's where we're directing to the foundations. If you ask me for UCD engineering, uh, I would argue that what we need is staff uh, and uh, you know, a refreshment of staff as well, ongoing appointments uh, of staff with a very strong understanding of the technology uh, directly among the foundations and that they can disseminate that for our students. Uh, so I, I would argue that on that list, uh, that is the silver bullet for us in Ireland and the UCD, is giving our students very, very strong uh, direct the foundations. I have some concerns when I'm involved with accreditation processes, that uh, in some cases in Ireland we take for granted that they're getting the direct the foundations. Uh, and the accreditation panel should not do that. I think they have to be absolutely clear that the uh, direct foundations are very strong. Uh, so I, I would see that there's a little bit of a slippage in our accreditation processes, particularly on, on that aspect. And uh, an Irish engineer uh, having very strong theoretical foundations, and for me that's, that's a fundamental uh, advantage. Now, uh, I, I do see that there's a, a certain dilemma there because uh, I don't believe uh, that interdisciplinary work will be strong unless the disciplinary work is strong. So we have to have very, very strong disciplines, and we have to do everything we can to ensure Maybe if I I'll just comment on, on that last point there, I think that that is extremely important. The when I say the interdisciplinary working and suggesting that maybe it's something done at a capstone level, it only makes sense once the students who have gone into engineering and who have gone into commerce, who have gone into the social sciences, have developed their disciplinary understanding, their disciplinary perspectives that then it makes any sense to bring them back together to work in an interdisciplinary mode. So I, I completely agree that we need to 
ensure that our students always still have that strong disciplinary training, which then they can bring as a strength to an interdisciplinary team. If everyone in the team has basically a little bit of knowledge of everything, then you've lost all of that. In terms of the theoretical foundations, I think that, that is important. And the question is how we can get these balances right and whether the, the new technology that we have can help us to get everything into the mix that we need. And then, then um, uh, David Jiminy of UC Engineering, um, the ludicrous situation is that I'm the fourth person to ask a question, and I'm the fourth person who's been a dean of engineering. There's something wrong here. <laughs> but my question. We're about to bring that the next question. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite reasonable. Um, did this mention the contribution that industry can make? supporting students during periods of their education and how, how, how valuable do you see that and what is the essence of what can be delivered in the education by that process? Uh, I think it, it's extremely useful in that capstone level. Um, if we talk about the engineering group project or the now more and more the interdisciplinary group project, that it's at that level that getting industry people in to talk to students about what it really means to work out there, to then participate as mentors on projects, whether they be an engineering project or an interdisciplinary project, that's extremely valuable because with universities such as our own competing in, in world lead tables, then we have excellent researchers. You know, our, our faculty are excellent researchers in terms of the theoretical foundations that Jerry was talking about, absolutely our faculty can give those theoretical foundations. But you, you know, you can't be everything. If you're a fantastic researcher, fantastic uh, understanding of the theoretical foundations, able to convey that to young and enthusiastic minds, you're not the same people that can teach those young and enthusiastic minds how they're going to work well in an industrial situation. So I, I think, and it's something that I've done in the past at UWA, uh, as I developed a, a Futures Foundation with uh, engineering partners, industrial partners, that I also brought some of them in to work and to, to actually deliver some teaching, particularly in terms of the team working and the group projects, to get them involved in mentoring these sort of capstone projects. It, internships, of, co of course, are great as well, and they're, they're a transition for the students. Okay, you and then you, and then you. All right, President uh, Ian Kermanen from the Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, I'd like to address, first of all, thank you very much for the most good meeting. Uh, I'd like to address the intercultural and global, uh, intercultural working and globalization. And uh, UCD is a, a, a leading university in Ireland, I think, in a proportion of students which it takes from abroad, and possibly in the number and proportion of undergraduates uh, which attends them. I don't know. But my question is uh, is there some sort of optimal uh, degree of interaction that we would desire? Is 20% all the like, or do you think it should be greater? Uh, and the second part of the question is, is there a joint accreditation between collaborating universities when students go abroad? Uh, and uh, is that a difficult process uh, to develop? Thank you. OK, so in terms of where UCD is placed in Ireland, we do have the largest portion of international students, and we also have the largest portion of Irish students going abroad. In, in comparison with international uh, comparators, then we'd be uh, relatively modest in terms of the percentage of, of international students, and particularly if you look to Australia, who were in this market uh, a, lot, a lot longer uh, ago. In terms of the students we send abroad, I'd say we're, we're up towards the best uh, internationally because uh, m 
even places like the US, there are a lot of students studying abroad, but compared to the US students that never go abroad, they're, they're actually quite a small proportion. So we, we are up at about the ambition uh, of most uh, countries, or where, where the best players in, in our comparators are, are, uh, are at at the moment. So that, that would be that part of the question. In terms of the optimum, it, it's very difficult to say. Now, mostly in, in international universities, at postgraduate level, it's tended to be that now the majority of students will be international. Uh, at a postgraduate master's or at a PhD level, most well-known universities around the world would have a majority of international students. At the undergraduate level, then 20% has been seen to be uh, around about the right mix to keep the culture of, of the home country. Because if you imagine a, a postgraduate degree really is it's advanced study and it doesn't need to have a cultural aspect to it. But in the undergraduate degree program where the, the students are just in the process of maturing into adults, then it does tend to be that in those programs, around 20% means that you still have a dominant home culture. And that, that's where at the moment people are seeing the balance to be about right. Now, there's, that's not a magic number. There's no theory, you know, a bit like the psychologists and their personality types. It, it's a little bit taken out of the air. I think what, what is the case, though, is everywhere in the world, then universities are assuming that if you mix students from different cultures together in a classroom, then there will be a development of intercultural competence in those students without it being present necessarily in the people that's teaching them and without them being given any instruction in the development of that or the things to expect. So I think we're, uh, as I say, it's something that we should be thinking about because just throwing someone in a river doesn't necessarily teach them to swim. Okay, next one there. Sorry, can you speak up a bit, please? Paul and Daly, I'm Nolene Daisy, and I'm a school engineer. And, uh, I had a question. Sorry, are you the UCD school engineer? Yes. Yes. Your name is Paul and Daly. Yes. Okay, you need to speak up, please. I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, that was my question. Um, it's more around, uh, I suppose, uh, the controversy between um, research and teaching in, in schools, in terms of, like, um, there, there's a huge emphasis on your research pedigree and your, how quick you are at it. And you might get assigned a, you know, a certain band of lectureship you know, based on that. But you're tasked with, I suppose, Jerry talked about like, making sure that our, our, our students are technically you know, brilliant. We, we need to get them to engage with the, with the material and inspire them to to apply themselves. I'm just wondering again thoughts on how you get that balance between, you know, making sure you see these rankings does say high based on like our research brilliance, but also that our students want to come to lectures because I, I don't think the college is going to Thank you. Okay. It's a multifaceted question there. Uh, the, the first thing that I, I should say is that more and more, I think the value of educating the best of our students in research intensive environments is being articulated and is being shown. So uh, I think that very much if you look into universities such as UCD and our comparators around the world, then there is, it's seen to be valuable to be educating the students in a research intensive environment, in an environment where the people lecturing them are not simply uh, bringing out the same lecture notes year after year, but are absolutely up to date with the latest developments in the field because they're making those developments and are over the course uh, of the four or five years bringing students into a, a research way of looking at the world, uh, an ability to do original research. As I've said in this, our world is changing. It's changing all the time. We need graduates who go out able to 
look into the next big thing that wasn't even thought about when they were at university, go and pull that out and be using it right at the cutting edge. So that's where I, I indicated that the capstone research project is still going to be extremely important. In terms of we, we bring our students through, by the time we let them go to youth, then they come out able to do that research, able to think as a researcher. And the only way you can do that is if your academics are research active, they're engaged in everything that's going on in their field. So that's, that's the, the characteristic of a research intensive university. And around the world, the best universities are the research intensives. We're, we're teaching the foundations, teaching the students to think. So uh, I don't think that there is any, any conflict at all in that. I think the research and teaching can come together to produce the sort of graduates that we produce from here. In terms of students attending lectures, now that's, uh, <laughs> that's a thorny issue, of course. The, the students have a choice, and um, uh, it, it was always my opinion that if students decided that they could learn without attending a lecture, that was, that was their choice to make. At, at university level, they're adults. We all have different learning styles. If the student learns, decides to learn by a different style, we've provided an opportunity, they've decided not to take it. So I, I'm not so concerned with that. Um, um, is it not very dangerous to assume or bring um, students that are going are just lazy? Well, the, and the, the other thing is that of course, some, some lecturers are more engaging than others. Some lecturers are easier to understand than others. Uh, some lecturers may come from a country where they have a strong accent. But the, what I tell the students is that once you get out into the workforce, you're going to be working with people. Some of them will be easier to understand and get along with than others. But you can't opt out. You know, we, we will expose you to a variety of learning opportunities uh, yes, we want our, our lecturers to engage, etc. But if a, a lecturer is excellent in terms of their, their reach and the subject matter, they're an excellent uh, researcher and they're an excellent research supervisor, then the fact that the undergraduate students have to work a little bit in the undergraduate lectures, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So what would be a shame is if the students came along and every lecture was a carbon copy, every lecturer was a carbon copy of every other lecturer. They all taught in the same way. They all used PowerPoint slides with the same uh, setup on them. And the students weren't exposed to this range of experiences. So yeah, I, I mean, this is not to say that we don't keep an eye on the performance of our staff in terms of module evaluations. This is not to say that when we're considering promotions, we're not just looking for research performance, we're looking for contributions in terms of teaching. Absolutely, every university is doing that and is looking at ways of improving that. So it's not to dismiss it, it's to say that we, we are looking at that and we do keep an eye on it, but it's also to say that Students are adults, they would choose learning opportunities. One of the, the controversial things is the re recording of lecturers and putting them on the web. You know, lecture capture. And uh, I used to do lecture capture and it, it probably reduced the, the number of people coming by 10%. But I, I'd always, you know, sneakily do things that if you looked at just the lecture capture, you, you would just uh, hear the the rest of the class, you know, the class laughing and you wouldn't know what, what was going on. So I, I tried to add value that if you were there, then you, you got extra and if you were just looking at the lecture capture, you miss, missed out. So th those are sort of things you can do. But again, it's a matter of we at university are teaching adults and we provide students with learning opportunities. They choose which ones of those opportunities they take up. We try to ensure that there is a good range of learning opportunities. Okay. Uh, Jerry Farrell, the Dean of the Science Science and the uh, Engineering and Environment at the DOT. I just want to return briefly to the internship work placement. Um, I just asked the professor about the experience of that in Australia, in the Australian system. Um, it's 
if one way in which you could meet many of the challenges was you tend to have different churches looking at them in different ways, staff perhaps on occasion might look at it and say it's a lost opportunity to fill the pain a little bit more with traditional modules or the absence of them, church placement. Uh, the income is perhaps looked at and as a way of reducing costs. Um, the companies may love it, but my question, I guess, two questions would be, what was the experience in the Australian system of placement and internship in engineering education? And do you believe it should be pervasive given the challenges that we face? So the, the uh, way that the Australian system worked in engineering specifically was that you had to have had at least 12 weeks practical experience during the course of your program to graduate. And you would have to uh, uh, submit a reflective report on your experience and what you had learned through that experience. So a minimum of 12 weeks. If you hadn't accumulated that by the end, then you wouldn't be able to graduate until you had actually gone out uh, and spent those 12 weeks. Um, and that, that was a, a long-standing tradition. Engineering firms expected that every summer they would take on uh, a cohort of, of engineering students. And that, that was valuable in the sense of having it, particularly the students that were able to get summer internships each summer, because they would be able to have some of that experience, uh, come back and benefit from it. However, the experience uh, on an internship is variable. And it's difficult for the university to control. So some students went to companies that gave them great experiences that would take them from one part of the organization to another, would give them meaningful things to do. Other companies, the, whoever had taken on the interns was not the person that was supervising it, supervising the interns. And the people supervising didn't quite get why they were looking after these kids. And, you know, the experience was quite variable. So I think from, it's a difficult thing, again, to get bal the balance right. It's very valuable, but there are challenges in, in the experience. Okay, hi. Professor, you're very welcome in um, Ireland, and good, the very best of luck in your, in your leadership of this, this great establishment. Um, I'm not a dean, um, I'm managing director of the enterprise, and I spent 25 years at a senior level in both multinationals and commercial semi-state companies. So I'm not going to ask an academic question, I'm going to ask a question from a business perspective. I've seen business go through extraordinary change, and I suppose in the last 25 years. And my two questions to you are one, have universities as institutions embraced change at the same pace as we in business are going to? And secondly, as somebody from the outside looking in, we hear about the funding deficit. What is the real story? How big is the funding de deficit? How material is it? And if it is real, how do you believe that gap should be addressed? Mm -hmm. Okay, so two, two very diff different questions. I'd say in terms of the way that universities have embraced change, then it's significant. And universities in the last 30 years have really transformed, but it's not as evident uh, as perhaps some of the transformations that have occurred in business. Uh, and uh, our uh, colleague uh, who's doing a PhD here referred to some of the tension there. Now, in a modern university, then a research-intensive university, there is a very significant pressure to ensure that all our faculty, all our academic staff, are research intensive, are publishing original research in the best journals around the world, that that research is being picked up, being read, being used, that those same academics are getting money to do research projects, advancing knowledge. You will have seen the Science Foundation Ireland, the various research projects that it funds in the universities. The people doing that work are our academics. In Ireland, then, we don't receive a full economic costing for that research. We contribute the time and the academics freely. And the academics do it because the only way to get advancement in modern universities is to be able to show that research productivity. And that, that has been a, a transformation over the last 30 years. The idea that 
a, a professor uh, during summer is just uh, lazing on the beach somewhere, you know, uh, is only working at the time that the university term is in session. This, this is an old-fashioned concept of a university. We're extremely competitive. We're competing at a global level. All of the technologies that you're using, we're using in terms of, of that part of the, the uh, endeavor of the university. In terms of the student experience, then we have academics who are bringing in all the technologies. You know, I talked about flipped classrooms, uh, various different modes of teaching, the international programs that we have. Uh, as PJ started off the trend, well, then we uh, send lectures uh, across from one side of the world to the other, all, all sorts actually. of things. <laughs> so, so all of this has been happening. In terms of the student experience, though, you might not be seeing huge amounts of change in that, but actually there are, because the, the things that the students are being exposed to, they're changing all the time as a result of all the things that, that I've been indicating. So it's changed a lot more than people realize or imagine. It's an extremely competitive place. It's a cutthroat uh, place where we have uh, staff uh, being poached from one university to another. Now, it's not so much within Ireland. Our competitors are uh, in the UK, they're in the US, they're in Australia, and in the, the various European countries. We're competing for the Horizon 2020 funding. The government set a target of 1.2 billion of research funding to come from Ireland, from Europe. Who's going to bring the majority of that? It's the <coughs> academics at the universities. So it, it has changed. In terms of the second question, uh, the, the funding, uh, or the, the deficit in, in terms of funding. So over the period of austerity, you're probably aware that the funding to the universities has been cut and cut quite significantly. More than that, we've been under what's called an employment control framework, which has been applied right the way across the public sector, and the universities have been taken into that. And that's meant that the numbers of academics that we have in the university has dropped reasonably significantly because the only way you can make the cutbacks and keep within the employment control framework is not to replace people when they are poached by the Australian university or by the English university. So we've lost people, we've lost them in a, a very unstrategic way. The other hand, the number of students has increased. So the effect has been that the student-staff ratio has increased very significantly over this period of time. So the net result of that is that colleagues within the university are working much harder. They're teaching bigger classes, they're teaching more classes, and at the same time, they can't afford to let their research slip because otherwise their, their advancement or their competitiveness in the global uh, university uh, hiring uh, regime would fall by the wayside. So actually, when I came into UCD at the beginning of 2014 and saw, you know, I went round and visited every school here and I got all the statistics for every school and I was absolutely amazed at how much teaching is being done by our colleagues and at the same time the research is being kept up and it's just because they have to do it. So the deficit is there but it's, it's being covered by colleagues working extremely hard. So we as a university are managing our finances so that we are not falling into deficit. Some of our uh, competitor institutions haven't managed their finances quite as well, but we are managing them to stay uh, flat. So we're not accumulating a deficit for, for the university or for the country, but it's done through the dedication of our colleagues. And I have to say that I, I was extremely impressed. In Australia, I think you would have had a riot and certainly in the UK, if you had asked colleagues to do what uh, our colleagues here at UCD have done, it, it's been an absolute credit, I think, uh, to the Irish overall, that this stoic nature has come through and that in order to bring Ireland back from where it was, the colleagues have been prepared to do that. I, in other countries, it wouldn't have happened. Okay, over on the left and then up in the middle. President, thanks for, uh, sorry, two comments on our education part. Thanks for an excellent presentation and we're really engaged question and answer session. Um, I just want to ask you a little bit about 
looking at your presentation, some of the points you raised about industry being more engineers for big demand, and indeed that was brought out in a employer survey which we published just today, where it creates demand for moments for ICT, followed by engineers across all of the employers around at the moment. Um, but I'm also thinking about Professor Nelson's point about quality of access and underrepresented groups and getting more and more people into engineering. I suppose I then keep them there as well too. And my question is about I suppose priority of entry points and priority of courses. Because we're quite a small country, but we seem to bring in quite a lot of students into a proliferation of courses and then lose quite a large number of them when we get them. And quite a large number of them when we get them there. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that, about the commonality of entry, or maybe back to your earlier study, the proliferation of courses and maybe crunching it back down to try and change you and try and attract them. Well, that, 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 of course, is something that UCD has been addressing. And in terms of engineering, David, what we only, how many entry points do we have to engineering at the moment? No, no, the, the number of entry routes, it, it, it's... So, Yeah, so at the moment we've gone down to two. So one is, is all of engineering and the other is a stream which adds architecture. And that, that would be the, the way that the trend has gone in Australia before that. I think UCD is leading the way in Ireland and Maynooth I think has probably gone a, a similar way. So in terms of the undergraduate entry points, then here at UCD we've been reducing them down. Engineering's down to one, science is down to one. We would hope over time that uh, for the social sciences and the arts and humanities, we would again get those down to a minimum number. So here the students will go into first year engineering, it would be a common first year, and then after that they will start to make decisions as they are better informed. Sorry? It's, it's a decision. I think that one has to respect the independence of the universities because if you look at the questions that are, I've raised in this conversation, then you can see that there is no right answer. And it would be a shame if all the universities in the country said, right, we're all going to, to do this. Uh, I think there needs to be one freedom for each university to look at what's happening, to try things. So we're trying things with a common entry. There has been a, a game played in Ireland here for many years with the university's salami slicing uh, courses, uh, programs, and putting artificially low numbers on those programs in order to generate CAO points, which are high. Uh, I was quite surprised coming here, and uh, I did look at the prospectus of a university that's located not too far from here, and was just absolutely astonished by the, the range of undergraduate programs, and that you know, a program would have a, a limit of 10 students on it, and you just know that these 10 students would be sitting in a lecture theatre with 200 other students, uh, and it wasn't a real separate program at all. So th this has been an Irish phenomenon, I think, in terms of the salami slicing. I haven't seen it anywhere else. Uh, what we have been doing at UCD, I think, is the international trend, which is to bring down to a, a much more limited number of entry points. I would hope that our fellow uh, universities would be observing that and observing that in science, as we went to a single entry point, actually our CAO points, on average, went up and that this, the, there certainly has been a good response from parents, from students, to having these broader entries, and I hope then that the other universities would, would follow suit because they would see an advantage. But I don't think it would be helpful for the HEA or anyone else to say, right, this is what you're going to do. I think you would get a, a very negative reaction. You want universities to adopt something because they believe in it and they want to make it work. Okay, now we have just two more questions and that's it. We're calling a halt after that. Uh, Mort, and then, and then Vincent. Uh, my name is Mort Coleman, I'm a former Irish and Engineers Ireland. But just to thank you very much for, 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 for all of you of the, the changes and the challenges in, in, in engineering education. I wish I had, had heard it as a, as a civil, civil engineering contractor, I wish I had heard it about 15 or 20 years ago. However, my, my, my comments, it's just a comment. Um, <laughs> Calculation and computer analysis. I mean, 
the skill of the skill of mechanically being able to computer, do computer analysis, computer analysis versus using one's own uh, software bothers me as a, as, a, as a former employer. I think any contractor or any employer would prefer to have somebody that can think for themselves. And I, as I say, it's, it's just a comment I have. I think that needs to have balance. Okay, thanks, Mark. Final question, Vincent. Okay, so uh, follow on maybe with one question. Vincent Harvey from UC Engineering. One of the challenges for Irish engineering education providers is the cost of educating an engineer relative to, let's say, social sciences. It's 20 years since the Irish government has made the quite populous decision for free fees to see my graduate and my parents even get a refund. Um, based on your, I suppose, Australian experience and the UK experience, do you have an ideal funding model and should students pay for their Okay, we'll and stay. that is the final question, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> and if he answers that, well, you know, he, he, he's, better, he's better than even we think, right? Okay, in, in terms of the, the first question, then, yeah, very, very definitely, I, I put it out there because what we need to work out is at what level should the students be able to do calculations manually? Clearly, they need to have an understanding of the foundations, they need to be able to do a certain amount manually. But once, once they can do that and you get into, uh, and I'm thinking here particularly of structural analysis, there, there is just no way you would analyze a complicated structure manually. It just wouldn't make sense. So although the student may be able to do manually a, a very simple problem with a two-span beam or something, the, the idea that they would do a, an extremely complex structure. The, the other thing is, if you think of something like finite element analysis, the, how much value is there in teaching a student the theoretical programming constructs to do finite element analysis when in the end they will only use the finite element program? So it, it, I'm not saying I have an answer, I'm just saying we need to think very carefully about the balance. In we're, we're way over time, folks, so I'm closing it down. I, I want to say that, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I... You didn't want me to say something on the funding model. Oh, it's on the funding model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you insist. <laughs> okay, so in terms of the funding model, it, it's, it's a complicated uh, discussion in terms of the balance between the, the public good and the private good of university-level education and at what level the public should be funding university education. So Ireland has a very, very high participation rate in third level education, one of the highest in the world. And if we were to open the system up even further, the question to the public is how much extra benefit is there to the public in having 60, 70 percent going through third level education? So the, the question is one of balance. So what I see as being the ideal funding model is that there is a portion that's contributed by the state and there's a portion that's contributed by the individual. The optimum would be that the individual doesn't pay their part until they benefit from the education, which leads you to uh, an income contingent loan system underwritten by the government so that people who never benefit from the education uh, never end up paying for it. So that, that's uh, my comment on that. Okay, all right. Uh, president, you have an immense knowledge and we're extremely proud and, and privileged to have you as our president, uh, not, not only because you're an engineer, but because uh, you have a very practical experience and practical approach and vision for the future. And indeed, the UCD strategy uh, shows that in spades. This is the, the third EGA function that the president has attended. We've had a, the pleasure of his company since three o'clock this afternoon. I don't know where he gets the energy, uh, to, uh, to do something like this um, and also to run the university, but he does. And as a token of our appreciation, I want to make a, a small presentation to the president. It's an engraved um, Dublin crystal uh, plaque, which is framed and it's engraved with his name and today's date and the sincere thanks of the UCD Engineering Graduates Association. <laughs>